Welcome back everybody. In this week's video, I'm going to dive into the idea of grinding alone or doing our work alone. And this is not a new idea. It's an idea actually that uh, I've been quite inspired by recently by somebody that I'm sure many of you have heard of, uh, triathlete famous kind of motivational speaker, David Goggins. And I really appreciate this idea of grinding alone, you know, like in Goggins story, uh, you know, he's quite often telling these stories about how he is up, you know, before the crack of dawn, running on his own, working out on his own, always doing the work for nobody else but himself, right? And I want to bring that forward into our metaphysical practice, our Reiki practice, our yoga practice, our mindfulness practice, psychedelic practice, whatever it may be. And the reason I think this is so important to always grind alone, well, I can't say always, right? I can't say always, but to, I think to always keep the idea of grinding alone front and center is that's when we're really going to meet ourself, right? That's the ideal setting or situational experience where we're going to be able to go inside the self and to really find what we are working to uncover. Right. You know, it's a space where we can't really make excuses. We can't really hide behind, uh, you know, the grandiose, the external. We have to go in. We have to face ourself. That might seem really daunting. I'm always very appreciative that this seems daunting for people who are maybe new to this practice or new to working uh, on the self, on healing the self, on your meditation work or whatever it might be. Yeah, it might seem like I don't want to be by myself. I don't want to sit by myself in practice, please give it a shot. I can promise you, I can absolutely promise you that your bodies, your physical, mental, and emotional, and spiritual bodies are far too intelligent to give you anything uh, that you can't already handle. You know what I mean? That you can't already face. And to me, I think that is the Achilles heel of group practices, right? In the metaphysical space and the wellness space, uh, even in the Reiki space, whatever it may be, obviously there's a huge amount of group work. There's a group Reiki shares, there's group yoga practice, there's circle meditation, shamanic journeys, all of that type of stuff, all of which I lead and I practice, by the way. So I'm not trying to, you know, shoot myself in the, in the foot here by saying, by decrying what I do. Obviously I do these all the time and there's great value to them but still always at the forefront should be the idea of turning in for the self, grinding alone. And yes, while indeed I hold global Reiki shares, global Reiki circles every Thursday, uh, for people all around the world, we come together once a week in practice. That doesn't supersede my daily practice of turning in as often as I can. So I say as often as I can because in reality, it, I would like it to be every day. In reality, it's absolutely most days. It's not every day, but it's absolutely most days. And going then back to this idea of the group, what are the limitations here, right? I've seen this far too often as a group facilitator, as a group leader, that there can be group think, okay? And this is an immediate trap, an immediate problem with uh, group practices. I promise you this resonates. If, if anybody's done any group work, you'll know what I'm talking about. When we're in that setting, you know, and then the teacher says something like, you know, what have you experienced? Does anybody want to share? There's always going to be somebody who raises their hand and they have this grandiose, crazy out of body or whatever metaphysical experience. You know, maybe they came into contact with their power animal and they saw it the first time and they downloaded this information. They did all of this amazing sounding stuff. That could very well have happened for that person, and indeed it probably did happen. The problem here, or the serious limitation to this discussion anyways, is what about for the other 20 people in the room? Did they have as equally of a, you know, kind of uplifting or out-of-body experience? They probably didn't, right? And so because they probably didn't have that experience, they're now going to feel like, oh, but maybe I didn't do something right, or maybe I, you know, didn't go deep enough, or I didn't let go enough, or the problem is me, and so on. So right there in a group setting, we're automatically setting ourselves up for a comparison situation, right? And 
comparisons are always led by the person who is the most outspoken or the most grandiose, most verbose, or whatever you might want to call it, right? It's going to be the person who has the most to say about their experience. That's where the bar is going to be set. And that's detrimental to everybody else in the room. So if you're that other person in the room and you've got your you know, practices maybe developing or you haven't tapped into these things yet, then you're going to feel self-conscious most likely because of what it seems like other people are experiencing. Most everybody in the room, and perhaps even the person who's saying they're experiencing these things, they're probably not experiencing them to the level that they're talking about it anyways, right? There's probably this egotism that's coming up in that experience as well. So don't get discouraged by these type of statements. But I think it can circle back now and we can look at the benefit here then of grinding alone, being alone. When you are alone in your practice, then whatever comes, comes. Whatever rises to the surface is your experience. There's nobody else there to you know, manipulate it or to interpret it or to judge it or to give any type of guidance or thoughts or any type of hyperbole on the practice. It's simply your practice. That's worth gold, right? That is gold because that's you. That's you turning in, not without anybody else's lens or experience, just you fully and 100% you, honestly you, in your raw state, turning in, grinding alone, right? So then another issue when we're looking at working together, right, working together in that space is this idea of, and I'm hesitant to say that this is an issue, but the idea of co-support. I would encourage everybody to step beyond the support of the group, right? Don't be limited by the feeling of your own potential, you know, like shaky knees or your, you know, instability or your insecurity on your journey. Remember that you are far too intelligent to open or uncover what you can't deal with yet. So maybe even repeat that. You are far too intelligent to open or uncover inside of you what you're not ready to deal with yet. And on top of that, not only are you not ready to deal with it yet, but you, you actually are ready to deal with it and you are ready to face it. That's why it's coming to the surface, right? And so I think what we can do, and we find this quite often in group circles or group practices, is everybody is there to support everybody else, right? And that's really beautiful. Obviously, I'm not discrediting that. Again, I do these things all the time. I do these circles every week at a minimum, right? But at some point, at some point, everybody in the circle has to turn inward, right? We can look at an analogy like this. Imagine like you're afraid to jump in the deep end of a swimming pool and everybody else in the circle is in the water already telling you like, yeah, it's great, it's great, come on in, come on in, you know, it's amazing, there's nothing to be afraid of, you can do it as well, you can do it. That's really beautiful, right? That support might be needed as we are moving on our journey. However, at some point, you're going to have to jump in the water. You're going to have to get wet, right? And when you finally get wet, your experience, your internal space, that's what you're jumping into, right? So if you can jump into that space confidently, courageously, quietly, without the mind or the body, you know, you can just kind of move with it and allow it to work with you, then the group becomes a crutch. That's the, the, the turning point here, right? The group prior to this jump is an aid. They're helping you to come into that space. When you jump into the self, then the group could actually become a crutch or a hindrance, right? It can become a problem to limit or throttle your forward journey inward because it might start to erode away the idea that you can't do it on your own right? And all of this work fundamentally is on your own. It's always on your own. We always have to go inside, right? Think about this from another perspective. And here's another limitation, I think, or a, a hindrance of the group mentality versus grinding alone or working on yourself alone. From a Reiki perspective, Reiki is almost always taught as a healing modality as something that 
I, as the Reiki practitioner, am going to give to the client. That's not how it works. And anybody who's saying it like this, it's not an honest discussion about what Reiki is. If I somehow had the power to heal somebody by touch, right, then that would be reflectively what all doctors do. It would be reflectively what everybody is doing for healing in and throughout the world, right? That would be the, the main primary care if it acted the way that we are quite often hearing Reiki to act. What does Reiki actually do? It helps us grind alone. It helps us go in to the self, right? So when my hands are on somebody and I'm working with a client, that stability in my space, in my mental and my physical space, that allows the individual on the table to feel that stability, to feel that neutrality. And so what do they do with that neutrality? They grind alone. They go in further into their self and face themselves with a little bit more honesty and a little bit more vigor, a little bit more depth, going into the root of the thing that they're trying to work with. And that's when we heal. That's how Reiki is a healing modality. It allows us to go into the thing that is giving us discomfort or suffering. It allows us to find the root and let go of the actual attachment to that root, right? So how does that look then from a group perspective and why is that potentially hindering? Well, anytime that a Reiki practitioner or Reiki teacher is claiming that they are doing the healing, see what I'm doing now is I'm taking the mantle of responsibility off of my shoulders and placing it onto the shoulders of the practitioner, right? Oh, you're a miracle worker. You're going to do it. Okay, then do it. Fix me. I'll lay on the table and you can heal me, right? That's simply not how it works. And by passing off that mantle to somebody else, we're not taking responsibility for our own journey. We're not grinding alone, right? Now, I know what, or at least I can assume the obvious counter argument to that is going to be a statement like, well, that's not fair. You know, people are really suffering. People are afraid to face themselves. It's really difficult and so on. I get that. I know it's really difficult. My journey has been really difficult. Your journey is probably really difficult, right? That never excuses the fact that we have to turn inward. And every single time that we turn inward, we find that we face a little bit of that fear or our attachment or whatever it may be, and then we're able to let go of it. And it never has hindered us. It has never been too difficult. It is never too scary. It's never too intense. We only face what we're ready to face, right? But if my entire onus of the session or the responsibility of the session has been placed on the group or on the teacher or the practitioner, then I'm actually not facing myself, right? And then it's a far too easy scapegoat for me to say, and this happens all the time, by the way, it's far too easy for me to then say, oh, well, I can't heal because I went to the best Reiki practitioner and they couldn't even heal me, right? That simply is fear. It's fear of letting go inside. Nobody else can do that for you, right? Nobody else can help you let go. You have to do it yourself. You have to let go finally yourself. It's not that nobody can help you. Obviously, people are helping you and people are helping us explore and go into that space. But what I mean by help is at some point, everybody has to let go themselves, right? They have to let go themselves. Nobody can let go for you. And so again, that's the beauty, I think, of grinding alone, of doing our work alone. Absolutely go into the group setting, go into the group practice. But then when we are alone, when we are quiet, when we are by ourselves, we come back and we do our work alone. We face ourselves alone, right? It's not a coincidence that this is the overarching fable of every religion, right? The prophets or the monks or the sages or the healers or whatever they may be, they go into isolation. They go in to work on themselves alone, right? So if we look at our Reiki practice from that perspective, if we look at our meditation practice, our psychedelic practice from that perspective, turning in, grinding alone, doing the work yourself, maybe we can uncover a new avenue into the self or maybe a more effective avenue into our own healing, right? Maybe one where we take responsibility for our own healing, where we take responsibility for our own actions, for our own attachments, right? 
you know, one of the great uh, psychedelic explorers, somebody who maybe a lot of you have heard of is Terence McKenna. And he talks about this quite often when he's doing his, he's passed away now, but when he was doing his um, journeys, he would journey alone on mushrooms, on marijuana, on whatever it might be. He would take enough to have an experience and he would do it alone, right? Because any time that we're with a group, their influence will then affect our experience. Their belief will affect our journey, right? And the group think might, it just might override our own intelligence and our own courage to go in, into the self. So if you can, grind alone, do your work alone, and do your work alone as often as you can. One thing that I'm always grounded by here when this gets a little bit heavy, because it will get heavy, it gets heavy for everybody, that's you healing, that's you letting go, right? Is the only thing to fear is fear itself. That's all we have to fear. If we're in a group setting that is 100% supportive and everybody is you know, hugging and sharing and, and doing all this type of stuff, then we're not actually, in many ways, we're not actually fully facing ourselves, right? We might not be ready to face ourselves. We might not be ready to think we can do it. But if we stay stuck in that group space, then we stay stuck in the group experience and the shared experience. And there, we are never looking in to our own experience. We're never going in and releasing our attachments. So grind alone, everybody, as much as you can, as often as you can, as deep as you can, grind alone in your Reiki practice, in your meditation practice, in your psychedelic practice, your yoga practice. Let go of the group think, let go of the group mentality, turn inward. This is where the healing is. This is where the resistance is, not external. Hope that helps everybody. As always, be well and in Goshao.